Are you feeling disconnected, lost, lonely, confused? None of us can successfully do life in isolation. We need a community to encourage, support, and thrive together. Our trials and triumphs, our highs and our lows are all intertwined. You do not have to do life alone. We are in this together. Think about the people in your life right now. The people in your home, school, workplace, your neighborhood, the people you do life with. That's your pocket. That's your life group. So embrace the pocket you are already in and go deeper in your Jesus journey, together. Experience for yourself why we say life is better with your pocket of people. And if you're still looking for that pocket, register for one of our Life Church sponsored groups. Let's do life together. Last time we learned how to view the word love in the Bible through the concept of charity. I know for me, it was a little shocking to think love is really charity, which is doing something for someone out of love with no expectation of anything in return. Of course, that's counterintuitive to our nature, to what we see around us, and to the world. Love isn't always easy. Love takes work. And sometimes we have to love in boldness. When we left off last time, Paul had just penned the words of one of the greatest pieces of prose poetry the world has ever seen. Looking for a solution to the perversion that had taken hold of the church in Corinth, he contemplated the characteristics that he'd experienced in Jesus. That Jesus, he was patient and kind. That he doesn't envy or boast, isn't proud, rude, self-seeking, or easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs, takes no pleasure in evil, but he rejoices in the truth. He bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. But most importantly, he never fails, ever. And from those characteristics, the formula was formed. Loving people with a love that doesn't depend on them loving us back. But that formula would be tested in Paul's life almost immediately. I want to talk about that in a message we're calling The Decision. So once he'd provided the formula for the perversion in the church, he made a decision. And it was difficult. He had to deal with some doctrine that had been distorted. And he felt a certain sense of urgency, thinking his life may quickly be coming to an end with many of the people who Solanus had favored being murdered or thrown in jail. Paul addressed a group of church people who'd begun teaching that the Christian blessing was only for this life. They were teaching that there was no life after death. So Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. Jesus died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Then Paul gives this list of people who'd seen Jesus and interacted with him after his resurrection, like hundreds of them. And Paul says, most of these dudes are still alive. Like, don't just take my word for it, go ask them for yourselves. And while you're at it, tell me this. Since we preach that Jesus rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there'll be no resurrection from the dead? This wasn't a new belief he was confronting. This was an old belief. It was the belief of a religious sect called the Sadducees, who denied the resurrection of the dead, the existence of spirits, and the use of oral traditions. They emphasized the acceptance of only the written law. They basically were teaching the total opposite to what Paul had been teaching. So again, Paul is speaking with an urgency. He's asking, why are you trying to do what's always been done? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. And if our hope in Jesus is only for this life, we should be pitied more than anyone else on earth. But in fact, Christ 
has been raised from the dead. He's the first of a great harvest of all who've died. But there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to him, they'll be raised when he comes back. After that, the end is gonna come. And then he'll turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Jesus must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Then Paul, he gets practical, even a little personal. He says, and why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, my dear brothers and sisters, I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Jesus has done in you. What value was there in fighting wild beasts and those people of Ephesus if there'll be no resurrection from the dead? He's like, y'all, I've been hammered for this for years because of this message. I mean, I've even contemplated wanting to die rather than press on fearful that I'll be put under enough pressure that I would renounce Jesus. But in spite of that fear, Paul presses on because the promise of resurrection eliminates the fear of the persecution he was facing right then. So even though Jesus gave his life and Paul was willing to give his life, these church people are looking to go back to these old Sadducee ways. So Paul says, if there's no resurrection, let's just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company, it corrupts good character. Think carefully about what's right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It'll happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who died will be raised to live forever. And those of us who are living, we're gonna be transformed. You know, I actually like how it's written in the King James Version. It says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Then he says, So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. The churches here in the province of Asia send greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. And friends, after 18 weeks of this series, that last scripture has struck me. Who gather in their home for church meetings. And it's brought me to a decision, and it was difficult. But I felt God speaking to me with an urgency, asking, why are you trying to do what's always been done? He said, I've been showing you the formula for the past four months throughout this entire series, over and over again. I've shown you examples of this early movement of Jesus' people who changed the world, who changed history forever by making their homes a sacred space, by gathering in their homes for church meetings, by having their family and their friends in their homes to bring the life-giving, life-changing message of Jesus to them. He said, depression is up, anger is up, Substance abuse is up. Domestic abuse, child abuse, they're up. Because rather than taking this opportunity to turn their homes into a sacred space, they've shifted the responsibility for the spiritual atmosphere, climate, and destiny of their homes onto everyone other than themselves. He said, why are you trying to do what's always been done and get back into a building that allows people to hide their faults and flaws and skirt the responsibility of determining that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
He said, it's not because you haven't been able to get into God's house. It's because God hasn't been able to get into your house. He said, so before I can release you to get back into a building that many of you have made the focus of your worship and spiritual identity and honestly have become codependent upon, I need you to make your homes a sacred space because more difficulty is coming. More oppression and more persecution are coming. So you better get your house in order because some of you spiritually, you're about to die. If you don't get your house in order, you will not recover. So as you listen to what the Lord's been speaking to me, I want you to understand, we aren't not in the building because we're afraid or because we're lazy or because we don't love church. It's hard not being in the building. Giving is down. We've had four staff members resign in the midst of this. And we miss seeing you every week. We miss the singing and I miss the stage. We miss the high fives and the hugs, the Jordans and the jokes. But it's pushing us to do what's best for you. It's pushing us to push you into creating a sacred space, a spiritual environment that'll see God, not me, fix your marriages and your finances and your relationship with your kids. And it'll ultimately break the codependent relationships some of you have with a church building rather than a relationship that's dependent on God. So today I'm speaking with an urgency and I'm using Paul's formula. I'm loving you with a love that doesn't depend on you loving me back. And I know this formula is gonna be tested almost immediately. Some of you are gonna be determined to do what you've always done. So you're gonna go somewhere else to get into their building. And I hate that. And I hate that because I love you. And I never want people to leave our church, but I feel pressed by God to tell you, we aren't gonna come back to any gatherings in our De Pere building until at least January. And we're doing that because there is a life after this one. And we're trying to get you onto the right side of that instead of back into a building. And because we're standing firm in the fact that we're not here to build a church. We're here to build the kingdom. You know, the key to building the kingdom is getting people into the kingdom. It's what we in the church world call salvation. We wanna give you the opportunity to do that. We wanna give you the opportunity to get into the kingdom so the kingdom can be built in your life. It's not a complicated process. In the church world, we call it getting saved. and We wanna give you the opportunity to get saved, to enter into a relationship with Jesus. Here's how we do that. In, in just a minute, I'm gonna say a few lines in a prayer and then I'm gonna pause. And when I pause, if you repeat those words, you mean them in your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. You will enter into a personal relationship with Jesus. If you submit yourself to that, we'll change everything. So if you're watching this and you say, Sean, I am a sinner. I want to be saved. I wanna come into God's kingdom. Would you say this after me? Would you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Would you come into my life? Would you change me, make me different, make me new? Be my Lord, be my Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, it is the most important, the greatest, most fantastic decision you've ever made in your life, and your life will never be the same. We wanna walk this out with you. So if you've prayed that, would you do us the honor of reaching out to us so that we can walk this journey with you? But we're not done. Maybe you're watching this and you're a Jesus guy or you're a Jesus girl. And you're like, bro, I'm going to heaven but something about this message, it prompted you when I said something about making your home a sacred space. I think some of you, you've been just treading water. You've been just biding time. You've been just waiting for this building to open back up because you thought maybe it would be next week or maybe it would be in two weeks. You haven't taken the opportunity to make your home a sacred space, but you know that you need to do that. 
You know, for 15 years, I took my marriage for granted. For 15 years, I, I took Sunny absolutely for granted. I acted like she would always be there. Until one day I came home and she was packing everything that she owned in her father's pickup truck and took my kids and drove down the road to Florida, left me on the driveway crying, bawling. I thought that I would never recover. But can I tell you, friend, in the four months that Sonny and I were separated, everything broke. Everything changed. For the last decade, I've had a beautiful marriage. I don't say that to brag, I just say that to brag on Jesus. Had we not taken that break, I promise you, we wouldn't be the people who we are today. And so can I tell you that in this pause that God has us on, we, we can either be defeated or we can move forward. And the way that we move forward is by making our homes a sacred space. And so if you've not done that, I wanna pray for you. God, thank you for my friends who are on here. God, I pray that you'd be with them, that you'd strengthen them, that you'd give them courage, that you'd make our homes a sacred space. We love you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just shine me up, but changes the depths of me. I will not fall short on the journey that I am now. Full of mountains and valleys, full of pain yet full of hope Jesus my destiny heaven be inside of me Jesus my victory these honest words let them be Prayer to the Prince of Peace, a prayer to the Mercy King. I will not forget the message that does just come, that doesn't just shine. Changes the depths of me. Will not fall short on the journey that I am now. For the mountains and valleys, for the pain, for yet. Jesus, my victory, these arms words, let them be a prayer to the Prince of Peace, a prayer to the Mercy King. Whoa.
Hey friends, as I said in my message, The Decision, we have done a turn. There's a reaction that will happen to this, I'm sure. If you haven't watched the message, I encourage you to go back and do that. It's a lot more detailed about how we sought God on the fact that we are not going to go back into large gatherings in our De Pere building until at least January. And we understand that that's going to well up in people, some emotions. Trust me, it welled up plenty of emotions in me and I know that it welled up plenty of emotions in you, but we didn't do this because we're afraid. We didn't do this because we're lazy. We didn't do this because we don't love church. We love church, Mm -hmm. we love you and we miss you. But simply, one of the things that I've said for the last decade is I don't pursue answers, I pursue peace. And as I pursued God on this, this was the peace that scripture says goes beyond understanding. And so we wanted to give you some things, uh, some, we would call them five get to's, not five have to's. These aren't five things that you have to do in the midst of this, but it's five things that you get to do in this. There's, there are five things that we're getting to do, five things that we're excited about. And so five get to's in the midst of this decision. And and the first is that we get to have a life-giving plan for our home. We've done that and tell the friends about it. Well, the plan, I think that's the key word to get to have a life-giving plan for our home because it can sound daunting to say, make your home life-giving, just do it. It's like, well, what does that mean? And I think that we've been forced to lean in and look at 
how would we make our home life giving? And you plan that. And some ways in which we've done that is we have had our own Jesus time, you right. and I separate. Yep. And that's not just because we're pastors, but because we're people. And we've had worship music playing at all times. And when it gets turned off, oh, you when notice. the Wi-Fi it's goes out, it's yep. the, we notice the temperature of our house. Mm -hmm. it's, the atmosphere changes. Uh, there's certain songs that our kids listen to while they're in the shower. And I'm like, you don't need to ever yeah. listen to that turn again. Off, like, man. turn it off. And, and there's certain shows and movies we just don't watch mm -hmm. as a family or individually. That's a plan that we're setting standards in our home. We're subtracting some stuff that's life sucking, life taking, yep. like life uh, draining. Mm -hmm. And instead we have a plan for a life giving atmosphere in our home. Yeah, and I think being in the midst of this pandemic for as long as we have, it's given us plenty of opportunity to do this. Yes. And it's given us plenty of opportunity to practice yes. and to kind of it's experiment yeah, with the things that do mm -hmm. work, with the things that don't. We started with games at the table and dinner at the table and some of those things, they've become less than they were in the beginning. But one of the things I encourage you, do not make less in your home is ushering in uh, the presence of God, which is what brings me to number two, is prepare your space for church. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you have kids, and we've made our kids, I call it a kid's show, a kid's Jesus show. Mm -hmm. It's like a show, it's like a cartoon, yeah. and it's so interactive that you could switch out a cartoon during the week and put this on and your kids would want it on repeat. And it doesn't, it doesn't just appeal to those who are kindergarten and first grade and up, it also appeals to our three-year-old niece like oh. crazy. And so to prepare a place where if you're having people over or just you and your family, that you have a place where your kids watch or engage in that kids show Saturday night or Sunday mm -hmm. morning, and then you prepare the place for where you're gonna have adult church. Well, and one of the most intentional things that we have to do is do it when it is just our family. Yeah. And even in our home, in the beginning, I don't think we, are, we were as intentional as we have become in the fact that we've made our kids sit up, we've made our kids engage. The discussion questions have certainly helped. We've yes. invited some other people into our home, uh, Brian and Season and Magnolia, that's, her sister, our brother-in-law, and our niece. We brought them in for one of the, because their pocket was on hope for and that And we week. had a new understanding for kids. Yeah, for sure. But once she settled in and kids show, or her other show mm -hmm. is in hand, then we were able to engage. Another thing that we've done is we allow that kids show to be something maybe you show them on Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon, uh, but you get to plan around your own schedule. And then mm -hmm. when we did add people, we did something we call Pocket Church. Yeah, which love we it. actually got these signs a couple months ago, but they're yard signs and they're two-sided. And Ooh. yeah, they're nice. Ah. And so for the Pocket Church sign, some people will never want to put this in their right. yard because they're like, I'm not looking to add people. Mm -hmm. And I think we've pulled back to say, your pocket starts with just your family. And then if you wanna to go to Exchange Pocket Church right. in De Pere, yep. or you wanna be in California, some of you are doing pockets in California, you don't need a yard sign out, but maybe you do want that. Maybe mm -hmm. you've been inviting your neighbors, so you stick it in the yard because the Pocket Church is here. So we have these and we're gonna be giving them out of the front lobby locally. Yeah, and then when you start to think about people who you wanna have in your pocket, because honestly, there's some people you don't yeah. want to have in your Pocket Church. There are people who you love, but you don't really wanna have in your home, at least during this time. And so the third get to is we get to engage with people with whom we're comfortable to take our mask off around. And I think that that's uh, both literal and metaphoric. And so are you comfortable to take your physical mask off? I don't wear a mask around, around you. Us, yeah. Um, but I also don't wear a metaphorical mask around right, you. And right. so over the last almost 25 years, I've learned to take that off. And so we get to engage with some of those people. And the pandemic has shrunk our circle, whether we wanted it to or not. And I've really leaned into that. And I love that, that it's made me very aware of those I want in my circle. Mm. It shrunk our circle to now, I know who I'd have in my pocket. Right. And you may only have your family or you may have your family plus two. Yeah. And so it doesn't have to be this massive thing. It's actually talking about the message and the Bible with people you can take your mask off around. Mm -hmm. And we have gone deeper with our kids yep. during this time. Oh, we have gone deeper with our friend who we had over. Mm -hmm. In this time, there's been tears, there's been laughter, there's been a, did you know that about 
no, did you know? <laughs> and we're like, wow, like, but we're safe. Which I think is awesome when they ask me. Yeah. Did you know that? And I go, I just said that. Yeah. I was, which is awesome <laughs> to do the pocket when you're the one who you're uh, talking, talking about. Talking about your message. Yeah. The message. I really like the way that Bob Goff, our friend who wrote some of my favorite books, said, who are the people you'd like to have around your deathbed? Mm. It's very interesting. There's only so much room. And so uh, here, here's the fourth get to, is we get to consider new ways to connect and grow. Yeah. There are a multitude of things starting mm -hmm. this fall. Journey to wholeness. Which I'll, is a must do. If you're alive, you need journey to wholeness. Sure. Some people think, well, if I've gone through something or abuse mm -hmm. or, or if I'm having marriage problems, maybe then. No, if you are breathing. Right. Like our daughter's doing journey to wholeness right now at 15. Amazing. And we're developing journey to wholeness for mm -hmm. teens. It's for everyone. So journey to wholeness, alpha, virtual life groups. We tried to do in-person life groups. And honestly, even when the spike hadn't come back mm -hmm. up, they didn't work. People weren't ready. They weren't feeling comfortable. So life groups are all virtual and circling up people and just going online and finding some options yeah. to circle up around. And then a new thing for moms called Flourish. So exciting. There are so many things in addition to getting together with people mm -hmm. and talking around the message. Yeah, and then this last one, this fifth we get to, and, and I'm hoping that this will like really kind of take the edge off some of our friends who are very traditional because we know that some people this this is going to push your comfort zone for us to say we're not having in-person gatherings into peer but that doesn't mean we're not having in-person gatherings right. we are still having in-person gatherings and so the fifth get to is you get to take advantage of in-person gatherings that we're having, not just in our city, but in other cities. Mm -hmm. Like here in downtown Green Bay, we have Life Church downtown. We do have Alpha. We do have uh, the Pocket Exchange Church. Pocket Church. And so there are other opportunities and there will be more opportunities. I'm saying this prophetically. Right. Coming to a city near you. Yeah, yeah. And it's the place where, again, you're with a group of people you know so well that you've already considered, will you go there and you're willing to leave your mask on? Will you go there and are mm -hmm. you able to take your mask off? Mm -hmm. Because we are in a time where there is a mandate. But frankly, our mandate did come from God right. that superseded all mandates. Yep. And that was to hold, to hold, hold on the large gathering. And what it has forced us to do is not to have to do these five things, mm. but to get to do these five things. We yeah. love you. Love you.